All right, here we are. Hey everybody, thanks for joining today. Uh, my name is Kate Pate and I'm the volunteer research for Unlimited Sciences. For those of you who are not yet familiar with Unlimited Sciences, we're a psychedelic research nonprofit that combines the power of data and lived experiences to serve the community, educate the public, and inform common sense practices and policies. We've been collaborating with Johns Hopkins University to develop an exciting psychedelic study and we'll have more information for you on that soon. You can learn more about us at unlimitedsciences.org. Um, just a heads up for all of you who are joining us in the audience, um, you're able to ask questions throughout the webinar um, using the, the question bar on the right. So if you have a question that you'd like the guests to answer, feel free to post that up there and we'll try to get to it time permitting. Um, also, if you wanna help support our work as a psychedelic researcher, please consider donating. Um, your contribution plays a vital role in supporting the research to improve our understanding of how psychedelic drugs, dosage, set and setting affect people's experiences and lead to more harm-free and positive outcomes. Um, plus, you have you can get some cool gifts in return. Um, thank you to our sponsor, Straight Hemp, for making this event possible. Straight Hemp is a leader in premium and pure hemp-based products and an advocate for democratizing natural plant-based medicines to replace societal dependencies on pharmaceutical options. Today, we'll be having an in-depth conversation about how psychedelic medicines could be used as an alternative mental health treatment for military veterans with Logan Stark, the producer of content at Black Rifle Coffee Company and former scout sniper in the U US Marine Corps, and Jericho Denman, the producer and military advisor at War Office Productions and former Army Ranger. Uh, Jericho and Logan will be offering their thoughts and experiences around mental health treatment options for active duty service members and veterans, uh, especially as that relates to traumatic brain injuries. Uh, and we'll discuss current perspectives within the veteran community on psychedelic med medicines. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two guests, uh, Jericho and Logan. Thank you both so much for being here. And um, to start, I'd love for both of you to give the audience a little bit more of an in-depth uh, description of kind of who you are, where you come from, how you ended up in the military and what you did and what your life's been like uh, since. So that way we have a little bit better understanding for kind of the backdrop for your perspectives on all of this. I'll go so first because mine will probably be way more brief than sure. <laughs> uh, so I'm a Michigander. I grew up in the, in the North and I joined the Marine Corps at 20 after a brief stint um, trying to figure my life out in college um, and joined up with a, an infantry contract. I went through that and um, did did a brief stint um, as a an assault man within the Marine Corps infantry and then uh, began the pursuit of becoming a scout sniper, did a couple more deployments, um, one to Afghanistan um, and a couple on a beautiful Navy ships. Um, and then after that, I got out uh, very shortly after finishing my Marine Corps career uh, and began pursuing a degree in professional writing. And the thing that kind of got me to where I currently am right now is that I, um, as part of a school project, I produced a documentary that was focused on kind of the before, during, and after of uh, going to Afghanistan and what that was like for, for me and the, a couple of the other guys I was with, um, which ultimately got me linked up with uh, the founders of Black Rifle Coffee and um, have been jamming on that ever since. Awesome. And Jericho, what about you? A little bit more on your, your background and experience for the folks watching. <clears throat> yeah, so just my background as far as um as far as my background uh, <laughs> um yeah so i grew up um i grew up i was an army brat so i lived all over the country and the world um i joined the army when i was 17 straight out of high school um went through uh the pipeline to become a ranger i spent 15 years in the 75th ranger regiment uh, change and then i uh, did like my twilight tour uh, during during my time in Ranger Regiment, I deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan multiple times. Um, and then kind of my twilight tour uh, was as the senior military science instructor at St. John's University in New York, um, which gave me a little bit of a time to uh, reset before I, I, I separated from the military and kind of look at 
you know, self-care and exploring all these options, of, uh, you know, mental health and uh, brain health and all that. Um, around about the time I was doing that and separating from the military, um, I had a couple of friends in the film industry. So um, I started tech advising. Um, I got one tech advising job and then kind of from there it became a thing. I started getting calls. So uh, for the last three years, I've been uh, working in the entertainment industry as a tech advisor, um, collaborator, and producer, um, and started a company called War Ops with my partner, who is a former Navy SEAL. Imagine that. And that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. Thanks for that. I, I'm curious what you both experienced while you were um, while you were in the military regarding um, mental health. So. Was that something that was discussed or talked about um, on a regular basis? So was it was it kind of normalized? Was it just taboo? What was it uh, maybe coming from leadership, but but also like what was the actual day to day like um, for you guys? Uh, Logan, do you uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Take that one. So uh, you know, like a lot of things, um, both in the military and in life, it. It really was from a uh, own personal perspective. We were um, we were forced to do a, a survey essentially uh, before we left, and then after we got back, and you know, there <clears throat> it wasn't mandatory that you go and talk to any sort of therapist or counselor or anything like that. But they made it available to us, and and they wanted to make it known that that was something that you could do and, and encourage that. Um, the the process for that um, was a little bit interesting because um, you know you're you're talking to the people that they have designated for you to talk to are are not individuals who have gone through anything that you just went through, um, and, and both in the military and then post working through the VA systems. A lot of the times, the people you're talking to um, they don't have an experience in the specific thing that that you're you're trying to work through really. Um, so it, it's really hard to find connection in that um, and, and kind of it after you get this this look after you like you tell people what you went through and what's going in your head. It happened to me multiple times where like people are kind of awestruck and they're like, oh, my God, I you can see it on their face. They're like, I, I don't know what to do. Like, I, I, I'm i not the guy for you, you know, and, and that's a really difficult thing to see on somebody's face and and for them to just be like, OK, that, so, yeah, so it was bad. All right. Um, here Here's what we can do, kind of, I think, um, you know, there's there was there's no solutions. And to the end of that, you know, there's mm -hmm. there's really there's we're in the middle of this we even though we've been fighting wars since the establishment of this country there there is no protocol for for how to do this you know what i mean i think that's kind of what's fun about for me going down to to peru with you guys and and participating in what like i i feel like we're kind of on the leading edge on some of this stuff and and i think that's hyper important for us to kind of look at did that answer the question Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Jer Jericho, is your experience kind of similar or, or what was it like for, for you regarding mental health? And was it something that was talked about? What was it um, like to, to hear leadership and what was it discussed? Like, how was it discussed among the guys even? Is that, you know, I, I think that we've heard, um, hey, it's OK, you can go get help. But then there's also this question of like, but is it OK? I mean, are, are we going to be, you know, like, is this going to be a red flag? So. I'd love to hear yeah, how, how that was. For yeah, you. So for me, um, I think in the latter, in the latter uh, half of my career in the, in the Ranger Regiment specifically, um, the thing that I, I try to kind of impart on young people and impart on, on people that talk about within the active duty military, especially in, you know, places like Marine Corps Infantry, Ranger Regiments, soft units is it's not over. Right. Like these are these are organizations that are that are like actively taking the fight to the enemy still to this present day. Right. So there is a large number. And, you know, I was the villain that we talk about um, as a leader in your regiment. I could admit that um, that, yeah, we know you have some things going on, but like we're going to saddle up in like six weeks here. You need to concentrate on training and you need to concentrate on taking care of your men. And we're going to go and do some very serious things and we need to 
let's bottle those things up, put them in a box and like not, and let's not take care of them. And I did that for, you know, years and years. Um, I can still remember saying to uh, one of my counterparts when I was in Ranger Battalion, uh, the worst thing they ever did to combat PTSD was giving it a name, right? Because now everyone thinks they have it. Um, so I remember making those types of statements, but I also remember there were people, I would listen, right? And a lot of the, my peers would listen and say, hey, let's talk this out, like, because I've been where you've been. But the taboo around seeing an actual uh, mental health professional was definitely there, right? I can talk mm -hmm. to my buddies about, hey, this is bothering me, that's bothering me. I can talk to, like, subordinates or, 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 or peers. Um, but as far as seeing mental health professionals, it was something you really didn't want to do. Um, it, it could, it could harm your reputation. Right. And, and, and at those, especially at higher levels, it can harm your reputation in like these political, um, um, circles. So, you know, if, if, if you and someone else are, are competing for the next level billet and you've gone and seen the mental health professional and the other person in that, in the running has not, what do you think is going to happen there? Right. So I think while there is a lot of tongue in cheek, go get checked out when the rubber meets the road, um, it does have residual effects on, on your career and on your reputation. And I think, I think that still carries out to this day. Yeah. Do you think, do you think that's also true in like in the civilian side of things now? Um, wh what you guys are doing, have you noticed, I mean, I'm curious as, as veterans, what your experience has been since you've been out regarding mental health and maybe through the VA or not through the VA, what options exist? Um, is it, is it, how has the transition been? Have you had any guidance on that? Uh, have there been resources presented to you? Uh, I know we all made our way to um, Peru for a very specific reason and we'll get to that here in, in, in a little bit, but how did that transition go and, and what have been, you know, your experiences through uh, the initial transition into kind of where you are now? What, what did you experience and with regard to yeah i health? think uh, kind of across the board as a society there's this huge divide that exists between people who have done what we did as a profession and and, and civilians there, there's very um because those are such vastly different experiences it's it's hard to have empathy in there so emotionally people aren't quite sure how to react or they don't know whether to thank you or or what and I specifically remember I was I had a couple of showings for that documentary I made and one of them was uh, with a group of um, like you know educated professionals um, professors and stuff like that and this like these two women came up to me and like they were like I'm so sorry you had to go through that like just just spilling pity at me and I was like, no, like, no, you've got it all wrong. Like, I, I wouldn't change a thing with what transpired over the course of, of that time. But I needed to do this in order for me to, like, work through things in my own head. And I think, I think there is a way for us to connect with things through, I don't know if you want to call it trauma or, like, harsh life experiences. I think, I think life is hard on everybody. Um, and I think it's, I think it's a, a good way to look at it is to think about it from, you know, us as humans, we were, we are built on a foundation of experiences. And if some of those experiences are awful or harsh, or, you know, you see things or you experience things, or you take actions that are difficult to do, and, and you're not quite sure how to process that that just doesn't go away because you're not doing that thing anymore. There is a residual leftover effect in your own body that <clears throat> happens, but both like physically in your brain and then your mental thought processes. I like to think of it, um, I have this analogy to where it's like uh, a dirt two track road, right? So if you drive down this dirt two track road over and over and over again, you are going, the ruts are going to get deeper and deeper and deeper. 
if you're driving on that, you're more likely to just stay on those two tracks. Through my process and, and working through some of this stuff and doing some research, I think that your brain is actually programmed the same way to where if synapses in your brain are firing from a fight or flight, a survival response, even though you may not be in those environments and those situations anymore, your brain is still going to fire that way. You can't just shut that off. And so that was a hyper important thing for me. And I think um, across the board for people to where they're like, hey, I went through this really bad thing, but it's still affecting me. Well, if you think about it in a different way to where it's not just a mental thing, like your brain actually changes based on your own personal experience, we can kind of start to put some pieces together to kind of understand what happens to us as humans. Yeah, absolutely. And I really appreciate the fact that you you mentioned life is kind of hard on, on everybody. And I think there's a misconception that PTSD and uh, you know just post-traumatic stress period is, is, is uh, primarily associated with military or combat. And people come into the military with having lived the whole life already. I mean, even if you join at 18, that's 18 years on this planet, it's not like people join the military and then things happen to them and then they come out and everything is related to military service. You know, this being, being a human on this planet is difficult and we all have different experiences and we're wired differently and, and our um, stress levels and all of that contribute to how we handle it. And your, your analogy is exactly right. I mean, when you, with being in the military, it certainly creates a high stress environment where you are kind of in this fight or flight mode nearly all the time. Uh, and that definitely can exacerbate or even like amplify some, some patterns that may already exist, or maybe you're creating this new pattern moving forward to continually drive over those ruts that are really maladaptive instead of beneficial. And so trying to get out of the ruts is, is kind of the, the goal here, you know, trying to create new patterns and healthy patterns. Um, and it can be difficult. And yeah, it's, it, I think that's where psychedelics certainly can, can have a role. Yeah, that's for why sure. um, I really agree with, with Jericho on that point that I think, you know, putting a name to this thing is, was a bad thing overall. Um, because each person's experience is so different. Um, and, and I do think that a lot of people, especially Jericho did so many deployments over the course of his career, those things stacked on, to, on top of one another are, are completely different than, than mine. And then like, so, so I think there are different levels and degrees to this and just lumping it all under one thing. I don't think that's the way we should approach it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jer Jericho, can you comment a little bit on, um, because you have done so many deployments and you were really exposed to a lot of things during your, your time in service. And I know traumatic brain injury is something that you've dealt with, um, repeat concussions and, and that kind of thing. Can you maybe explain a little bit as to how that's affected you, but also kind of in the mental health piece and what deployments like that have been like and um to, to create this uh this scenario for you that you've been trying to to manage with regard to brain health sure. <clears throat> um so i think to kind of talk about some of the stuff like what, what logan was talking about all these like i i always talk about um you know the the people talk about PTSD or shell shock and they talk about former wars and then they compare it to, to our kind of contemporary wars, the GWAT, if you will. And the thing that's very different about ours um, is we have come so far in training and, and making people adapt to the things that they're going to see in combat. Right. Um, we've gotten almost too good at it. Okay. So like I can say, that I had symptoms of PTSD, like before I went to combat. Um, and people joke and laugh about, Hey, this, this dude never did anything. This, like, if you live in this very high stress, hyper competitive, you know, alpha eat alpha type environment for years and years and years. And especially in kind of like, you know, the or or soft, or, or these like standards-based organizations where you're like always kind of at risk of losing your job. Um, 
but what really losing your job means in that environment is losing your family, right? Losing your tribe. So I think that a lot of the compounding, you know, we, we talk about, you know, the number of deployments I did, right? Um, I did all total. It's like almost five years worth of combat deployments, but I was less stressed out in that combat environment than I was in the training environment because it was simple, clear cut. And I knew what I was supposed to be doing. Um, the thing that I think really affected me over the years was just being in this hyper competitive environment um, and trying to hold on to my family, right? Everything, job performance and all these things could, could yield, lead, the, lead to me losing this tribe, right? And I think that's really what compounded for me. And I think that's what compounds for a lot of people that are in, you know, line infantry units, soft units and things like that. Um, and then with tacking on the TBI portion, right, is you are, you are being saddled with this healthcare uh, apparatus that I don't know how many times I heard, um, you know, in, in like the last few years of my, of my uh, career when I was, you know, out of the Ranger Regiment and trying to get care for like TBIs and PTSD and all these things. Healthcare providers would be like, well, we don't know if that's TBI or PTSD. Sorry, like uh, we don't know how to attack that. Right. Um, so for me, a, a big turning point and a positive turning point in regard to the TBI thing was when I went to a thing called NICO, the National Intrepid Center of Excellence, it's like a big TBI care center and getting an MRI and actually seeing scar tissue on my brain and being like, fuck, OK, something's fucking wrong with me. Right. <laughs> I I can take all the cognitive tests in the world that are like these these marks for TBI and do all these. I, I even had a, a, a cognitive therapist be like, well, we don't know if this is TBI or if you just have attention deficit disorder, right? So there are so many new things that are happening to our generation of veteran, both in the compounding, just link the war, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's, it can vote now, you know, it's that old. Um, <laughs> so the length of this war combined with there are things that happened to me in combat that if I had had, if I had been in some of the blasts that I was in, in Vietnam, in that generation of vehicle, I would be dead. Right. But because of, of our military hardware and, and, and personal protection devices and all these things, we now have people that have these ailments that no one has ever seen in, in the, the history of human warfare. Right. So, it's, it's this really hard thing to like, is this a physiological problem? Is this a mental problem? And to kind of circle around, it's, it's the Iowa, it's, it's psychedelics that have really brought all that stuff together. And it, it, it lets you step back and see these things. Right. Um, and like Logan's analogy, my analogy is my feelings are the dashboard on my car. Right. So like, when my check engine light comes on, it means either my gas cap is loose or I'm making some kind of big mistake. You know what I mean? So it's something small or it's something big. I need to take a look at it. If the tire pressure is low, I need to put air in the tires. Um, so for me, my feelings are now the dashboard on my car. Right. And I've, I've been able to step back and realize that the physiological affects the psychological and vice versa. Right. So, um, Getting, getting these things uh, out to other people, uh, to the, you know, the, the people stepping off the line, you know, the guys and gals that are getting out of the military now and coming off these long careers. I think where our, our responsibility is, is, is being those experts. Like I am not an, I have anecdotal experience, but if, the more we do this and the more we get Logan's and Jericho's and Kate's out there talking to one another and being, Hey, yeah, this works and doesn't. And I had a doctor tell me this and a doctor tell me they're doing the best they can. But, you know, my, my uh, therapist, she's seen one military guy in her entire career. So how is she going to build a set of best practices when, when she, her, her experience is anecdotal at best. So it's, it's best for us to, you know, kind of all come together and, and yeah, like recognize that Logan is an expert at this point, right? He is a, a person with this specific set of circumstances and 
Kate is, you are an expert in that, like, you know, like 15 or 20 of us like this, right? So it, like Logan said, it's, it's, it's kind of on us now to, to carry this torch and do these things for this next group, because we're figuring it out just like, just like the veterans of every other war figured out their specific problem sets. We have a problem set to figure out as well. Rank complete. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's, that's so true. And that brings us to this, uh, this discussion, really the, the point of bringing us all here together today is really this discussion around psychedelics as medicine. And, you know, the three of us have obviously um, ha had that experience in, uh, in Peru through Heroic Hearts Project uh, going on an ayahuasca uh, retreat last year, last, last May. But I'm curious if um, you guys could share before we go into that and what that was like and how you, you came to those experiences, if you could share your perspective on psychedelic medicines, kind of like how you grew up and then, you know, what, what your thoughts were around psychedelic medicines and how you found your way to it or maybe how your perspective shifted over time. Um, so, Logan, what, how was that for you growing up? Yeah, I, I don't remember a specific point in my life uh, or there, there wasn't like a one specific catalyst, but I remember going back even to my high school years is uh, I made this conscious effort that um, I would the, maybe the most important thing that I would do in my life would be to pursue enlightenment. And there were some things that I had gone through in my life, uh, when I was growing up and some things that I had experienced growing up that kind of helped shape that. But that, that has always been <clears throat> my lighthouse for me um, is to constantly go back to know thyself. Are you doing things that are expanding your awareness of everything that's going on? And it was really when I started contemplating this concept of, you know, first, mushrooms and then working into some of the the other things as well is that i going through that trip that experience like that was really mind opening to me i experienced something i felt something i thought differently i felt different and i felt more when when i was going through that that sort of thing and to me, that is a direct causal effect of my overall mission statement as who, who, who I am as a human, right? So that, that opened up this huge Pandora's box of, okay, so if this is step one and there's unlimited steps, where do I go? What, what are my next steps? What's the next thing I can try? What's the next thing I can potentially do to feed back to my first overall enlightenment mission statement for me and it when i it's not it's not the only thing and that's the thing i want to like make sure you know we're going to talk about this experience with uh substance but that's not like it's one way it, it is one way in a huge bundle of things that we can do to raise our overall awareness of self and consciousness and society and culture within what we do and i think for me, way down the line is for me to be able to do and feel the way that I feel on substances without having to take those things to where I can generate those things on my own. You know, I, I look at, you know, what what is mushrooms? Like, what what is it? It is nature's chemical compound for something that we already produce in our brain. It gives us this amazing, incredible, like what it, when I'm on that, like, I, I feel like I taste better. I smell better. My vision seems enhanced. It's this wild thing, but I already have that chemical compound in my, my brain produces that. Is there a way for me to do that without said thing? That question alone is like so enticing to me. It keeps me up at night. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And actually, um, you know, there, there's a lot of research to show that even, you know, meditation alone, when you, you go deep into a, a, a meditation, you can actually get your brain to, um, kind of react similarly, if you will, 
uh, to what it looks like when you are on a psychedelic substance and just your, you know, five minute or 10 minute um, uh, Headspace app may not get you there, but, um, but certainly it's accessible. It's a very good point. Yeah. And that was, that was one of the other things um, somebody's bringing up uh, Bessel van der Kolk and, and, and breath work and stuff like that. Before I did any sort of psychedelic substance, one of the big things that I went through was that um, I had this yoga teacher when I was going to Michigan State found me and was like, hey, I'm doing this study and I'm trying to link um, yoga and meditation back to, you know, psychological improvement. You're working with the psych department at the university. And so for one summer, uh, nine weeks, every week I would go and I would do yoga and I would meditate and then I would go into the psych department and perform a series of tests with the ECG thing hooked up on my head and all of that. And it was after I started doing breath work and after I started doing like a little mini meditation session about halfway through applying the things that I was doing before yoga, during yoga, after yoga, during these, you know, psychological tests hooked up to a machine that I implemented those, that my results and my performance within those psychological tests skyrocketed. Like I, I went like, like my performance doubled over the course of the next five weeks. And for me, that was like such a huge awakening moment that it's like, I can control my focus, my, my brain's capacity and, and operational capacity. I can control that just through breathing. Like you think about that, that's insane. Like doing breath work can increase your brain's capacity. I don't think a lot of people even think about that or, or even would comprehend something like that. Yeah, I think a lot of people also, like it almost seems too easy. You know, it's like if I'm not taking a substance, it can't have that strong of an effect. Like people just maybe don't buy it because it seems so easy. You know, I think there could be a, a mental barrier for folks there, which Again, you kind of have to experience it to, to know. And you know what you're you're saying really reminds me of something that Jericho always says, which is you are the medicine. Um, you know that you don't necessarily need to ingest substances, but but certainly it's kind of like breadcrumbs to help you get back there to learn how to do it on your own. Um, Jericho, what has your experience been like, and what was your perspective? How did you kind of find your way into this realm? Yeah. So, um, my perspective and just finding my way to the medicine. I mean, it, it finds us, I guess, but, uh, before that in just like my path to wellness, I guess you could say, um, was like Rocky. And that's where a lot of the stuff I was talking about before came into play. Like people don't know what to do with us. Somebody, somebody like me, like I went to one, he was a, he was a TBI specialist and I talked to him. He, <laughs> he was visibly shook when I was talking, telling him like, how many blasts I survived, how long I was a breacher, all these things I did. And he's just like, okay, well, I, I usually see guys who did like, you know, a couple things. Uh, I, I got, like, it, it freaked him out, um, which is not like very settling to be in the, in the patient's chair and seeing that stuff. But you, again, you have to treat yourself like, like a problem set, just like we did in the military. If I, if I went to a new area of operations and there was like an insurgent network network there, I wasn't like, Oh, I don't know how to wrap my head around this. Like I saw it as a problem set as a mission. And that's how I saw myself. And I think that's, that's a key part of, of finding wellness for veterans is like taking care of yourself. Like you would take care of like your people when you were in the military. So that was like a big step was like realizing I need to take care of myself. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just kind of the path was, um, I've tried everything, right. I, I tried traditional talk therapy. Um, and I'll get, I'll get to the meditation stuff. I tried, you know, acupuncture, I tried yoga, I've tried all these things and even meditation just wouldn't stick. Right. And I likened it because to, I just didn't do it long enough, right? Um, all the stuff that are my perceived problems, those things took me 20 years to develop, right? So they're going to take me a long time. It's still a process. They're going to take me a long time of habits 
to, to tear those things down. Um, and I think the meditation and, you know, breath work is a very good example of how I started to take my own experiences and my own feelings. And, and, and this was after, you know, ayahuasca and, and, and drinking the medicine that I, I was able to kind of do this and like, look like, Hey, when you meditate, like these things happen and you need to take yourself out of this somehow. Right. And then I kind of discovered, Hey, doing, instead of meditating, I, I box breathe in a cold shower because I can't think of anything except for how cold this water is. Right. And then after I kind of took that, took that power back for myself, then now I don't have to be in the cold shower to do it. And now I can actually meditate instead of box breathe. Right. Where I'm just like honed in on the, the second counts of these breaths. Um, but the thing that kind of took me to the medicine and, and, and that was, you know, I had tried everything that was traditional. Um, I grew up, I wasn't quite a dare, I wasn't like a square, a dare kid, but I, I was very committed to being in the military. And I didn't see, you know, recreational drug use as a path to get me there. Um, no, like moral stop from having me do drugs. I just didn't do them. Um, and then after I retired, you know, I was, I was diagnosed with sleep apnea. I, I would have, you know, in a sleep study, I would have 17 disturbances an hour in my sleep. So I basically never slept. Um, and then when I retired, I smoked weed for the first time. And I was like, oh, this is kind of nice. Yeah, this is good, whatever. But then the next morning when I woke up from having had a full night's sleep because I was able to actually sleep, I felt euphoric. I felt like the best high I'd ever felt in my life. And it was just from getting a full night's sleep. And that was what kind of showed me like, hey, there are substances out there and there are things out there that aren't there to get you high or make you, you know, have a good time. They are actually plants that are out there in, in the world that can help you, you know, just like eating a balanced diet makes you healthy. Well, so do some of these substances. So that kind of took down a lot of the, um, you know, the stigma around uh, drugs. Right. And then, you know, honestly, the thing that brought me to psychedelics was listening to Joe Rogan podcast. You know, I would listen to these guys talk about psychedelics all the time. I'm like, there must be something there. Um, so I, I started giving them a shot and I, you know, I started with mushrooms and, and LSD and, and that, you know, led to a day on, 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 a, on a mountain uh, after I'd taken a couple of spills on a snowboard, bonked my head a couple of times. And uh, you told me about, you know, heroic hearts and all that. And that's kind of the, the way I got to it. Thank you. Yeah. It, Logan, I'm curious for you, if you could explain how you ended up finding your way to um, Heroic Hearts Project. Is that something that you, uh, it was a resource that you were aware of? Um, it, this is just ultimately for the audience to kind of understand where to find resources to have these kinds of experiences um, where they can access these medicines for healing. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it found me really um yeah it was someone had uh or, or jesse had reached out um to one of the other guys who's kind of talks about um hallucinogens a little bit and, and he was on a podcast fairly frequently the amount of lsd that this individual had done over the course of a year um, will baffle you uh <clears throat> and so he was he was originally going to go on the trip and i heard about it. i was like hey like what are you doing what's going on here he's like yeah i'll hook you up with the guy and so he linked me up with with jesse who runs for oak hearts and like i think it was like just a matter of months before we ended up going down to Peru. but and what what was that experience like for you in Peru? are we jumping into that already <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so I want to lead in with this saying that I, I don't think it's a fix all. I don't think it's for everybody. I think it takes a, a characteristically strong human to go and do what we did. I, it, I will say it's, I don't think it's for the faint of heart. Uh, it is the most amount of self introspection you can pack into 10 days. I, I think ever. You know, I, 
I'm looking back and I'm thinking about whether I will ever go do that again, I'm going to ask myself that question again in like 10 years because it's so intense. Um, and so <clears throat> for those listening, we, we, we did four ceremonies over the course of 10 days and uh, it, it was a, it was a roller coaster for me personally. Um, and it, it's interesting because um, down there in the jungle, they say, you know, they we refer to the medicine as, you know, mother ayahuasca or like it, we almost give it this almost, you know, human like perspective and characteristics and stuff like that. And it, it went like full hero's journey on me. Like I felt like I died during the third one. Like I, I went to a very dark, dark place and, and went to the deepest recesses of who I am as a human and, and was really forced to deal with the things that are holding me back in my progression. And then the, the last ceremony, I felt like I had come to peace with what the medicine was and I had begun the process of controlling it almost. I felt like I could communicate with it and that I could structure my journey more than it taking me on this ride, right? Um, so within that, um, we went with a group of guys who had been through some awful shit in their life. You know, I think if you could tally the number of gunfights that we collectively had been in, it would be in the thousands. Um, and it it wasn't like some of those nights weren't super enjoyable. I'll tell you that. Like I was expecting to go in there and it would be like drums and palm fronds, skin sauce. Like it was intense. At points, it was insane. You know, I, I look back to that first ceremony and within – 45 minutes when the medicine starts like really grabbing you, we had a guy who is laughing like the Joker as loud as he could. And you got another person banging on the floor. Kate, I think you started crying like an hour into that first session and, and, and you're being gripped by this thing. That's so powerful. You're forced to just, it, you're weighted on the ground. And so I had to deal with that expectation for me, like trying to like work through this and then also kind of be aware of what everybody else was going through. Um, it, it was a lot more communal than I expected it to be for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely felt that too. I mean, it, it seemed like a, uh, a, a communal experience absolutely i mean everybody was having energy passed around and we were all kind of participating in the same like it was very very real i mean you could hear it but you could also feel it and it, it was a bonding experience obviously um for many of us and i think that that um certainly played into my experience overall and that was important for me and i don't know how you guys feel about that but i mean it, it seems like when you're in the military you develop very close bonds with the people that you're with and that they become your family more than just your, your teammates. And um, I think that the, there's power in these medicines to help people who are missing that get some of that again. You know, when they go through these experiences with people, they can form another brother, sister, or brotherhood or sisterhood outside of the military that can, can be beneficial. You go through these really powerful and sometimes traumatic experiences together, but then you work through it together too. And I think that that can be very healing for, for some people. Um, Jericho, do you want to explain your, your experience there? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll explain one, one million. Well, I'll well, explain one, one million. Really. Million, it'll <laughs> take me five hours. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, sure. just to do uh, kind of like what I took is like the overarching thing from it um was you know as i went down there you know i had i had experienced some psychedelics before but i talked to a couple people who had experienced ayahuasca um in peru and and the the person who i talked to that i kind of trusted the most who had like really good who didn't get on a soapbox and talk all this he said just don't be afraid to die 
That's what that was like. You'll trust me. You know what I mean? And, and now I, I came back and I was like, dude, you're full of shit. That didn't mean anything to me because I was like going into it. I was like, cool, man. Like I did that for years. I saddled up every night and was like, All right, I'm going to go out and maybe I'll die. Whatever. I'd come to accept it. Um, and I think going into it, like having that attitude provided me with a shit ton of turbulence. Um, as you guys remember, my, my first ceremony was <laughs> fucking horrible. Um, I mean, it wasn't horrible. It was, it was beautiful, but it was really hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life was that first ceremony. Um, in the midst of it, I was begging to die. I would, I wished I could die. Um, and I didn't come out of that first ceremony with really anything positive. Uh, it just, the medicine was fighting me for, for my ego. Like I, for so many years had, had been, you know, back to my childhood, even before the military, I had been ingrained with like, I can take care of myself and I can take care of everybody else too. And I don't need this. Um, somewhere in my psyche, it was like, I got this, I can handle the world. I'm not afraid of shit. And it kicked my ass. Um, pretty much every horrible fear I've ever had in my life, uh, I experienced that night um, in, the, in, in the medicine. Um, it, it fucked me up. It put me in the pain cave hard. Um, and then, you know, I think a lot of what it, what really brought me through, like, like Logan said, was the next day talking it through with everyone. And, you know, a lot of people had the like, great, ex they're like, oh, I saw my, you know, I saw my, you know, deceased relative and it was beautiful. And I was like, motherfucker, what was I doing wrong? <laughs> um, but then, you know, in that second ceremony, I, I started to experience some turbulence and then, you know, I, I died like more times than I can count in more different ways than I can count. And I just saw this beauty in dying and like letting go of control. And like, you know, it wasn't that I was scared to die. It's that I was scared. I was letting people down by dying. So once I kind of saw that, that like, Hey, you just being happy and taking is what really is taking care of those around you. Um, and then, you know, I, I saw a lot of really great things, but kind of to talk more about the Logan said, it's not a fix all. It's not something you go do and you get better. Um, you have to really put in the effort to see what it's showing you and, and to apply what it's showing you. It doesn't always show you things you want to see. And it doesn't always show you things that are going to make your life easier. It shows you how to control your own feelings to put into practice the, the habits that are going to make you a healthy person for yourself and then for those around you. So yeah, it was to, to summarize, you know, Peru, it's, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, but it's like most things we do that are hard. It, it, it provided me with the most growth. Yeah, that's incredible to hear. And I think a lot of people, so just for the audience, we are talking about ayahuasca here. And I think that there are other plant medicines, certainly that can offer really um, powerful experiences like these um, psilocybin mushrooms, for sure, ibogaine as well. Um, there are various uh, alternative therapies, if you will, for uh, a number of different things. And it really is a matter of what you know what an individual needs help with and what they're seeking and what the right fit is and i think it's extremely important that um that people are prepared that they don't just go in and you know looking looking for recreational drugs to get high I and mean, that's not what this is about at all um but i will say that it's really um it's interesting to see within the veteran community specifically and i think this also just applies in general to the general population you see a lot of people who throw things out i mean we're seeing this right now with you know, means of just all cops need to do ayahuasca or everybody needs to take, you know, take drugs or do these mushrooms and everything will be fixed. And I think that that's kind of, um, I understand and appreciate that these medicines are for everyone. And I think everyone could benefit, but I also feel like it isn't like, you have to be careful, right? Like, again, the medicine found on you guys, it's not like you went seeking for some, you know, some, some random high here, it was a, a really powerful thing for you. And I think that when people are called to these medicines, I think that's really important for them to listen to that, but just to have respect for the process too. 
um, is really interesting. I don't know if you guys saw, but OAF Nation made a post uh, like last week or the week before about um, mushrooms and just kind of alternative plant therapies for healing. And maybe now is the time to explore this. And there were probably a thousand comments that were totally polarizing. You saw, you know, both ends of the spectrum. Um, and so it does seem to still be this, you know, and the comments were really disparaging too. Like if you use plant medicines, you must be, you know, self expletive because, you know, I don't know, just you guys know how it is in the community. So I think that what do you think is, is the way to shift the narrative around this stuff instead of getting this, you know, I'm the, the stoner veteran who just gets high and doesn't, you know, do anything. Like how, how do you, how do you change the narrative that people I think speak? we do what we're doing right now and, and share these, these positive experiences from, from an educated standpoint, right? Like, or, like you said, we're, we were down there to, to chase some high, we were down there to become better people through it through and, and we should be doing this as humans we should be trying all of this different stuff to see how we can be better uh you know i've had another really powerful experience with it with a different psychedelic i did uh, mescaline um <clears throat> prior to going to peru um which is a sister plant of peyote and that ex that ceremony experience for me was awful. I, I do not care to repeat what happened during that ceremony, but I had been dealing with some physical health issues, specifically my, my guts and my intestinal system. I went to the hospital. They told me I might have AIDS basically because they thought it might be an autoimmune disorder. It wasn't, I don't have AIDS. Don't worry. Um, but I, I could not find a solution from traditional medicine. I didn't go to do mescaline to fix this thing, but 48 hours after it, my, my body had felt better than it had in probably close to a decade. Like it completely washed my entire system. So I think when, when we look at things like this, it's like, well, that's weird, that's, that's a drug. Let's be honest, we're made of drugs. Mm -hmm. That's all our bodies are. We're just a big bottle of drugs floating around in a human skin suit. That's all we are. That's all that this thing is that we're doing right now. So when we look at this stuff, for these alternative stuff, we know like there's not a lot of, you know, awful side effects. You know, I, I've done some research a little bit, like it's kind of iffy whether or not somebody has actually died from doing ayahuasca. Nobody's ever died from smoking weed. I don't know if there anybody from uh, psilocybin, but we're we're not we're not pursuing something negative here. We're we're pursuing self betterment, and I think that it's going to be people having a voice about this and like you know what. You can, you can, you can, and you should pursue these other things if that fits into what you want to do as a human. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Jericho, do you want to uh, address, Amanda has a question. We can kind of take a look here through the audience questions and see if we can get to some of those. Um, but since Peru, uh, any significant changes for the betterment of your mental health um, that directly correlate to your experiences there? Sure. Um, I want to touch like one little quick point about your last question um, for me that is like absolutely helped me within since since uh, since Peru. Um, and we always talk about ego, right? Like killing our ego. And I think a problem that a lot of uh, vets have, I had it very particularly, is um, in battling those naysayers, like the people who get on the comment section and say, hey, if, if you do these things, you're just a punk and like you're weak and yada, yada. Um, the way to combat that is for me, I had to drop my ego in order to sing my own praises, right? Um, and I think it's important for, for people like Logan and myself and others to be like, hey, dude, I was in combat for almost five years. I don't even know how many firefights I've been in or how many times I've been blown. I will stack my gunfighter resume against pretty much anybody out there. And let's see if you want to call me those things. Right. And I think that's an important part of getting it out there is not being like, 
we have this ingrained in us, this quiet professionalism. And, and yes, absolutely. But facts are facts, right? And you can, you can look at me on paper. You can look at Logan on paper and say, hey, no, we're not weak for doing this. We're smart. We are, we are fighting our current fight. We're, we're battling this current mission set, which is, you know, self-care. So if that's, that's like going out in, into a, a gunfight with uh, nothing but a pocket knife and saying, I'm tough for doing this. No, you're not tough. You're stupid. Right. So that's, that's the one thing I wanted to kind of hit on is, is, uh, you know, we need, we need to, you know, take back that narrative. Like, Hey, no, this doesn't make you weak. If you want to call me that, like, what have you done? Right. Um, and then for, you know, to answer Amanda's question, significant changes, the things that I've noticed are the kind of things that I, I, I touched on before. And that is just that I have a, I don't know. It's weird. I can see my own feelings as symptoms rather than problems. It's the number one thing I would take out of that is that, you know, I, I mean, I talk to Kate all the time. I talk to Logan all the time. And one of the things I very often say is, and I, I've stopped using the word sad now or depressed. Like yeah, I'm feeling, I use the word melancholy now because it's just, sometimes you feel sad and sometimes you need to um, sad or melancholy is the same thing as feeling happy or excited. It's a feeling that we have that is a symptom of something, or it's just a natural cycle that my body is moving through. Um, and for me, that's the number one change I've noticed in myself is that I, I can kind of subjectively look at my feelings as symptoms rather than problems. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a huge, that's a huge lesson for sure. And, and Logan, like since coming back from Peru for you, um, how have you, has there been anything that you can link regarding mental health specifically to, to answer this same question um, that you can tie back to your experience? Yeah. Um, yeah. There's, there? there's three things that I'll share that, you know, come to mind immediately um, that, that have betterment that I have, kept with me since then and why it's been 14 months. How long has it been since we went? Something like that. Yep. Um, and it's funny because these things came to me all at different uh, ceremonies. It was, it wasn't one that was just like, here, here's your lessons all in one big bash. They came to me throughout the course of doing this multiple times. And the first one happened it was the first thing that happened to me of note, really, on the in the first ceremony. Um, for me, the ceremonies were extremely visual. Like the the hallucinations that I experienced were like profound. I cannot erase them from my brain. And you know, they told us before we went down there, like, don't expect to hallucinate or get visions because it doesn't happen for everybody. So I had no feelings that that would happen for me. And within 30 minutes of taking it the first night, I was on a rocket ship surfing the galaxy with the most wonderful array of colors and shapes and movement that I've ever experienced in my entire life. And then all of that stopped and I had like my first true vision and I was sitting in this tree in the jungle and I knew I was up high, I could tell off the ground, I was surrounded by these brilliant pur vivid purples and stuff like that and <clears throat> this bird thing dropped down in front of me and at first it was hanging upside down and it was it was like a a jungle bird mixed with uh someone wearing a plague mask like i, I very visually remember a bird but a plague mask which you know after analyzing this was, you know, it was a medical thing. It was a, a betterment thing. I was, I was getting a, a message about health, about wellness. And this bird immediately brought out its little claw and it started cutting me open. It was like a, a glowing laser and it started cutting my throat open. And I was, I remember thinking to myself as this was happening, I was like, I feel like I should be terrified right now. Like it's, the, I'm just getting going in this and it's already opening me up. And then this bird 
it takes out this glowing crystal and drops it inside of me and then all these different hands come together and they stitch me up and then the bird takes off well that can be interpreted a, a number of different ways but what i took out of that is that i have to have a voice i have to be doing exactly what we're doing right now um, and that is important for me and where i kind of sit um, within our community is uh, I have to be speaking about these things. It cannot be silent when it comes to those things. And that's directly attached to my overall mental well-being. So that was the first big one. The second one was peanut butter jelly time. Probably one of my favorite hallucination visions from the overall ceremony is I was doing my galaxy surfing thing again. And at this point, I had, I had a guide. Like, I had this, like omnipresent thing with me that was like showing me different stuff within my visions and we were surfing along and then we stopped and there was this peanut butter and jelly sandwich the size of a, a death star like that's how i kind of interpret the scale of this peanut butter and jelly sandwich was absolutely enormous and within my like little surfing my omnipresent guide was talking to me as we're going into the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's like, Logan, this, this part, this peanut butter and jelly represents the, the pieces that you need to ensure you're doing for in your life. And it tied a specific number to it. It said, you need to ensure that at least 20% of your time when you're awake is dedicated towards uh, a few set of things that will help you in your life. Those things being specifically for me, journaling, meditation, yoga, exercise. You have to do those. You have to spend a decent chunk of time. Otherwise, you will dive down into the darkness. I, I can't ever lose that. I, like that, that is stuck with me forever. I have to hold on to that every day. And you know, we as humans, we kind of let stuff drop off. But one thing that I've specifically done to that is like, I am meticulous about journaling now. Like everywhere I go, I have my notepad and sometimes it's about work stuff. Sometimes it's about personal things. Sometimes it's just little tidbits, one or two words where like, I really want to remember this. I want to, I want to think about that thing later. And that to me, just collecting or connecting on a regular basis to my you know, consciousness is, is very important for who I am and my overall mental health. Uh, and, and the last thing was, was really the last lesson that I learned on the trip. Um, after I, I felt like I could sort of kind of structure my overall journey within what I was doing within the medicine, the, the first three ceremonies, I was just, I was an observer. I was, I was on this ride. Um, that, that last one, I, I figured out a way to communicate with the medicine and like, no, here's what I want. Here's what I want to know. Here's, here's what I want you to show me. And, and I, and I kind of had to, it was weird because I remember we like narrating this in my head and trying to figure out a way to like communicate effectively what I wanted to do. But <clears throat> the last lesson that I really take away from all of that is, you know, whether that be on a, a vision quest or whatever it is, you're in control. It, it doesn't matter what's going on, how you are internally, what's going on in your head, you're in control of that. Nobody else. It doesn't matter if you're a little depressed or you're on cloud nine. You're responsible for those things. You are responsible for what's going on between your ears and how you overall feel. You have to take that responsibility and understand that you can control that. Yeah, that's, that's super helpful. Um, and I, I think one of the things I know we're, we're looking at the time here. One of the things that we also wanted to touch on was just kind of um, if you guys could describe what it was like to come home um, after having an experience like that, whether it's you're specifically referring to the Peru trip and ayahuasca or any other kind of experience with psychedelic medicine where you've had um, a profound experience and you're, you're coming out of that and you're returning to your normal life where you have friends and family and a job um 
how has that been and how, what were the challenges? How did you overcome that? Yeah, Jericho, you wanna take that one? Um, yeah, so one of the things I, I would like to, to talk about, and I'm glad you asked about coming home, is that, and I've seen this with other people that, that, that do the medicine, is, is it's, going, it's going to test you, right? Um, and you're gonna have that bounce. I think uh, I experienced uh, a couple months after, you know, you have this glow, like everything's great. <laughs> like, yeah, like I just lost everything, but well, it doesn't matter because I'm the medicine and, and that lasts for, you know, a month and it's, it's beautiful, it's great. Um, and then you, you bounce out of that. And, and personally um, with, you know, a couple of episodes of like extreme melancholy and, and extreme sadness and depression those were the things that I needed. Right. And it just, it showed me. Um, and I think it was, you know, the medicine still being inside me and like saying, Hey, here's, okay. You have these tools. It's great. You can, you can be this way when you're happy and life's going well, here, here's, here's what is going to happen. Or, or let's, let's let you use these tools to, you know, combat some of the things that have been problems in your life in the past. Um, so for me, I think it was, the homecoming was was great and it's still great i'm still coming home i'm still gleaning amazing beautiful lessons from from that experience um and it's it's realizing you know that that all these feelings and all these things are just life and and we all we all live it and and one of the things really great things that i i took from peru that i've, I've carried with me throughout and especially in dealing with, you know, with a lot of veterans who, not dealing with, but talking to a lot of veterans who reach out to me about mental health and, and, and plant medicines is something that, uh, I don't know if you remember Nico telling it to you, Kate, because, you know, for everybody listening, Kate would sit there and be like, oh, I, I haven't experienced anything for you guys. I don't know what you said about right? So, um, and that is, you know, I always mess this quote up, but it's, there's no difference between the feelings of a child losing their doll and a king losing their crown. I don't remember if that's the exact thing, but it basically gets down to we all decide how we feel about our lot in life, right? And if Tom Cruise had to switch places with me today, his life would be absolutely ruined. But I think my life is awesome, right? So it's all a matter of, of how we apply what's going on in here to what's happening in our life because this is all we control and no one can take that from us um so that is a big thing that i've carried and that's what i that's one of the things i brought home was a lesson that you know through our group talks and stuff was, was a thing that we talked with you about. it was just it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. You can have a great life no matter what's going on in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that mm -hmm. reminder. Logan, how was it for you coming home and jumping? Did you jump right back into work immediately? And, and how did your friends and family kind of feel about you and maybe being- Yeah, I, I did. You know, taking 10 days to, to go to the jungle was, the, the only time I've taken off since I've, I've started really my professional working career. Um, but I, I was kind of surrounded by a, a ton of happiness and joy uh, upon that initial return. I, it was similar to other things that I've happened, you know, a, a big trip or, or coming back from a deployment. Like you really feel like you accomplished something, you know, like we went on a journey and it was a journey of self-improvement and reflection. And like, I came back from that. I like, I had a kind of a sense of pride that, you know, at, you know, a, a fairly young age, like that I had the ability to accomplish something like that. You know, not a lot of people have done ayahuasca in general, let alone, you know, kind of at this point in their life have ever, after having all these other life experiences stacked on top of one another. So I was just like, I, I would, I was filled with this sense of like gratitude for, for what I had been able to go through and, and, and be able to, to kind of encapsulate. And, you know, I like 
made my girlfriend like read my journal from that time so that she could kind of get a sense of like what I had been through. And she was like, holy shit, man. Like, wow. Wow. You know, like just, just your, your articulation of, of your visions alone was like incredible. And then, yeah, I kind of, you know, you get back into the flow of life and it's, it's difficult because you have a new perspective on, on what's important. And that's what I've been doing a lot since coming back is that I have a, I have a very clear idea in my head about how I want to live my life. You know, the, the day to day of that, how I want to communicate, like what, what my tasks and actions are with what, in what I do every day. So I came back more than anything. Like I had a to-do list that I needed to accomplish in order to like sync up my day to day life with what I knew I should be doing. Like I, I'm a, I'm, I, I can't stop moving. Like it is super hard for me. Like if I hadn't been running my mouth for this hour, I would have been pacing around this room. And, and so I was kind of in this position to where I was like, I was in front of a computer a lot. And like, I didn't feel like I had a lot of freedom within what I was doing on a daily basis. And ever since then I've been working towards achieving that goal and, and I have, like, I'm super happy just overall. Like I'm having fun with what I'm doing every single day. The the people that I get to encounter, like it, it has this better feeling to me overall. And I think that was sitting there before waiting for me to acknowledging it, but it, it kind of curtails off of what Jericho said as far as like, Hey, you know, you have the choice about how you view your opinion. You know, I don't have a, huge house or I don't have a ton of money in my bank. Like, I don't care. Like, it's really not what important. It's like when you wake up in the morning, like, are you happy? Like, are you glad that you're alive? Are you excited? Like, I just have so much more passion. Like, like, you know, I'm driving from Texas to Salt Lake City. I'm just like constantly on the phone because I want to get shit done. And like, I, I feel like just this, like, I can construct everything how I want it to be in that that piece in my life that was kind of missing it has really cemented itself. And I've been able to craft what I want to do really well. That's awesome. I'm really stoked for you. I'm stoked for both of you. Um, And we are over time, but I would love to ask you guys one more question uh, before closing it out. And that would be um, if you knew the whole world was watching right now, and you had one thing that you could say that you knew everybody would hear. Um, and it can be a lesson that you learned from the medicine, the medicines, whichever you, you know, whatever, whichever one it comes from. Um, or it could just be something about psychedelic medicine in general. What would, what would you want to say? What would you want people to hear? Sorry to put you on the spot. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, for me, uh, I, I've kind of gone back and forth uh, up, up top here with my, my concept of God and, you know, whether this thing exists and, and, and what that is. And before going down to the jungle and doing ayahuasca, like, I had this like kind of different theory about, about what that concept is and what that means returning and going through that is like i have a very firm belief now that we, we are all one and and everything is connected and that if we look at this in the grand scope of thing like we're we're all responsible in a way to kind of acknowledge the fact that consciously we're we're connected and we're all going to just disappear from the larger perspective of of the universe and it's we're not going to mean a damn thing in in a million years from now but acknowledging the fact that we're all in this thing together that's what the ceremony some really cemented for me it is really difficult for me to be looking at what's going on across the world right now like i'm really sad about it like i'm filled with this like just 
burdening sadness because it's like, guys, we're, we're, we're all on the same team. And, and we, if you could only imagine what we could do if we had perspective unity across our, across our planet, like what we could accomplish, like, it feels like we're taking two steps back. And, and if we, I feel like if we take this more communal sense that we're all one thing, we kind of could maybe start to shift the overall ethos of what we're trying to do as a human culture. I guess um, if I were to just try and impart something on everybody in the world, if mine would be um, really concentrate on in our lives on action instead of reaction. I think for me, having good habits and leading with love and empathy and uh, leading with hard work and effort, um, make it so that I don't have to react as much because when we react, it's, it's, it's not thought out. It's, it's, um, those are the things that get us into trouble. Right. And I think that, you know, having had those things ingrained in us for so long in the military, not that they're bad. Those were things that like enabled us to survive right in a, in a deadly environment. Um, but those are not good habits for living a happy, healthy life. Right. So really setting yourself up to be able to live your life through action instead of reaction. That's fine. Awesome. Well said, both of you. Um, thank you both so much for being here today. It's truly a pleasure and it's always great to see you. And uh, thanks to the audience as well. Thanks for everybody who tuned in to listen and watch. We really appreciate you and your questions. And if you feel like questions weren't answered, you can always follow up and um, and provide resources uh, for those of you interested. Um, thanks again to our sponsor um, as well, Straight Hemp, for making this event possible. And if you want to support the uh, work that we do as a psychedelic research nonprofit, please consider donating. Um, everyone, please stay safe, stay well, and thanks again for, for tuning in. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. Me.